All right, we are back. Hopefully people are seeing this on the screen. I'm just gonna double check that real quick before we get going again. Uh, so again, I apologize, um, but we are looking right now. All right, so we're back. I'm hearing that we're back. Everybody should be able to see the Bonefish 101 diagram on their screen now. Again, I apologize for that, but we'll get right back into it. Um, so like I said, bonefish at their very oldest can live to be 20, 21 uh, years of age. And they are cal this is calculated by counting uh, the otoliths, which are their ear bones. Uh, like you would count the rings on a tree, those otoliths have growth rings. Um, and bonefish are aggregate spawners, which means that they will collect in large schools of hundreds, sometimes thousands of individuals and move to one specific location and then spawn in that location. Uh, so when they do this, they can travel large distances, you know, sometimes over 100 miles, as you can see there. Uh, and then this is a really great uh, image here in the middle of the graphic of bonefish diversity across the world. So you can see they're spread throughout the tropical and, you know, warm, temperate waters of the world. Uh, we have them in the Pacific, the Atlantic, uh, the South Pacific, uh, the Indian Ocean even. And these are all different species of bonefish. Uh, but like I said, they all have that very distinct profile with the single dorsal fin, the deeply forked tail, the silver mirrored scales. Uh, and something really interesting about bonefish that's not super common in the marine world is that they have a leptocephalus larva. Uh, so there's about a thousand species that have this larva. Um, and it looks like that picture there in the bottom left of this graphic. Uh, and for bonefish, uh, right after they hatch, after that aggregate spawning event, uh, the eggs are transported in the currents of the ocean. Uh, and then they hatch and this leptocephali or the leptocephalus larva uh, exists for about two months. And then in a matter of 10 days, uh, they transform into a juvenile bonefish, which is looks pretty much exactly like the adult bonefish, just a little bit smaller. So that's uh, not super common in the marine world, and it, it's pretty distinguishable in the bonefish's uh, life history. All right, so now we're going to move on to you know what bonefish do on a daily basis. Uh, so bonefish are famous uh, for being really tidally influenced. So on the outgoing, in the coming tide. Uh, an outgoing tide is when they're going to be moving onto and off of the flats uh, and they use what we call flat highways to move onto and off of the flats. So bonefish, you know, aside from those long migrations that they make to spawn, they don't have a super variable home range. It's just a couple of square miles or a couple of square kilometers. So on a daily basis, you know, they're going to be feeding on uh, pretty much the same couple of flats in a very uh, central area. And to get onto and off of these high, onto and off of these flats, excuse me, uh, as the tides are coming in and moving out, they use what we call flat highways. Now these can be um, anything from a slightly deeper part of the flat that connects to deeper water, or it could be a deep 40 foot channel right next to a ankle deep flat. Uh, it depends, it varies from flat to flat what this flat highway is, but it's important to know because since bonefish have such a small home range, and they're feeding on the same flats every day, they are using the exact same path to get onto and off of the flats every day. Now, when they're on the flats, uh, they're eating, right? They come onto the shallow water uh, to feed on things like crabs, shrimp, polychaete worms, uh, all those little benthic invertebrates. Uh, and a, a particular behavior that they do because the water is so shallow, uh, when they're digging around with that long rubbery snout that they have, uh, sticking their noses in the mud, they'll actually invert their bodies and wave those tails in the air when they're sticking out of the water. Uh, and this is what that looks like. Uh, so this is an image of a school of bonefish feeding, uh, or as we like to call it, tailing. Now, if you're an angler and you're, you're looking to catch bonefish, this is a great thing to see. It means that the bonefish uh, is, it's a dead giveaway that that fish is feeding happily. Um, and it's a, it's a great fish to target when you are fishing. Uh, so I do have a, a short video uh, that sh shows some examples of bonefish feeding right here. So I'll go ahead and put that on for you guys. Uh, in the shallow water here, you can see there's two bonefish feeding together. Uh, that shorter triangular fin to the left would be their dorsal fin, and then you have that deeply forked tail uh, to the right. Um, and you can see that, you know, bonefish, these are probably five, six, seven pound bonefish. They're not really big fish, uh, and they really do move into the shallow, shallow water uh, to feed. And this is a great example of tailing. All right. Now we're going to talk about why uh, the Bahamas are a perfect place to find bonefish uh, and why there are so many bonefish found here in the Bahamas. Uh, this picture here is a pretty typical example of a tidal flat. Uh, there's deeper water in the background of that image. 
the angler here in the forefront is standing on the flat. You can see it's not very deep at all. And then we have mangroves at the edge of the flat. Uh, so this is an aerial image, uh, satellite image of the Bahamas. And as you can see, a lot of the water surrounding the Bahamian islands is shallow, super, super shallow. That light, light blue color uh, indicates shallow water. Uh, and because it's so shallow and where the Bahamas are located on the globe, it's really warm too. So throughout the year, this water stays shallow and it stays really, really warm. And this is perfect for bonefish. They can be active. Um, and a lot of these Bahamian islands also have mud or sand tidal flats. Uh, that surround the islands. So in addition to the shallow water off of the islands, they can move up to the coastlines and slide onto those flats using those flat highways that we talked about earlier uh, and feed on all these flats. Uh, on Andros specifically, uh, you can see here, Andros is on the left of your image here. Uh, on the east coast of Andros, we have the Andros Barrier Reef, uh, the third largest barrier reef in the world. Um, and what happens is when you have a barrier reef and an island like Andros, in between the two, uh, there's a lagoon effect created. So the barrier reef protects Andros uh, from heavy wave action and storms and things like that. So between the barrier reef and the island, uh, there's a lot less wave action and the water is very calm and shallow. And this is ideal for bonefish. Uh, and this kind of environment is found all along the subtropics, which is why there is such a wide distribution of bonefish around the world. So in addition to that warm, shallow water with the flats, um, we also have lots of mangroves and tidally influenced mangrove creeks in this part of the world. Uh, and mangroves, especially those that are flooded tidally, uh, are fantastic food source for bonefish. So a lot of us uh, have probably talked about bonefish, or not bonefish, excuse me, mangroves in classes before and talked about how mangroves are great at protecting the coastline as well as uh, being a great nursery for juvenile fish. And that's definitely true, especially they're true for juvenile bonefish. Juvenile bonefish love to hang out in the mangroves. And But what's great about mangroves uh, is that there's lots and lots of juvenile animals in them. So there's lots of small crabs and lots of small shrimp. And when these mangroves flood tidally as the high tide approaches in, the bonefish will follow that tide into the mangroves and they have not only a more protected area to feed with more cover to hide from from predators, uh, but also because there is so much life in these mangroves, uh, it's, it's a much more biodiverse area than the flats for these bonefish to feed on. Um, so in addition to the protection, it's also a great additional food source. And a lot of the flats that we have here in the Bahamas are either bordered by or contain mangroves in them. So it's really the best of both worlds for bonefish here. Uh, so now we're going to get into a little bit about uh, fishing for bonefish and, you know, why bonefish are important as a species in the Bahamas. Uh, so in 2008, 2,500 jobs or 2,500 jobs were directly tied to bonefishing in the Bahamas. Now, that doesn't seem like a whole lot until you look at the rest of the numbers, right? So 60% of the Bahamian economy depends on tourism. Um, and there are a ton of economic benefits that uh, bonefish bring to the Bahamas. Uh, flats fishing, according to a 2019 study done by the Fisheries Conservation Foundation, accounts for almost $170 million each year uh, in the Bahamas. Now, that's a huge portion of the uh, economy, and 11% of visitors that visited the Bahamas in 2008 uh, spent some of their time fishing. Uh, and when people do come here to fish, all of the spending that they do accounts for 20% of all the recreational spending that's done in the Bahamas on a yearly basis. Uh, and that's every single year. So every single year, 20% of recreational spending is directly tied to fishing. And most of that fishing is bone fishing. Uh, in addition, anglers who come to the Bahamas to fish for bonefish are on average spending 27% more than other visitors. So other tourists, people are coming here to enjoy the beaches or maybe people coming to do other forms of ecotourism like birding. Uh, so when anglers come here, they're paying guides every single day to take them out on boats to go find bonefish to catch as a in addition to maybe staying at a bonefish lodge, you know, a hotel type scenario where they cater to uh, people who come here to fly fish or conventionally fish for bonefish specifically. Uh, so bonefishing and the, the bonefish species are incredibly important to the Bahamian economy. Uh, now, when people are fishing for bonefish, you know, a lot of times people ask, why bonefish? Why do people want to catch bonefish? What's so exciting about bonefish? Uh, the, the first thing that draws anglers to the Bahamas to catch bonefish is that warm, shallow water, like we mentioned earlier. 
Uh, that warm, shallow water means that sight fishing is going to be the name of the game. Uh, you are not actively, if you've ever been fishing before, a lot of times you're casting into the water and waiting for a fish to find your bait or you're maybe retrieving a lure through the water. With bonefish, uh, you're actively walking around on the flats or maybe uh, being pulled around uh, on the flats, on a flat skiff like we see here on the right, actually looking for the fish. So you're not casting towards these fish until you actually see them, which can be really exciting. Uh, it's a lot more like hunting than it is fishing, uh, and it's a pretty new angling experience to people who have never done it before. Uh, in addition, uh, bonefish are really hard to catch. Uh, they're very smart living on these tidal flats and in these uh, coastal estuaries and things like that. They have lots of predators, uh, and in that shallow water, they see everything, right? If you're going to see a bonefish, it's probably already seen you. Uh, in addition, they live in beautiful places, right? I mean, the Bahamas is a beautiful area. The, all of the subtropics are beautiful, so anglers love to travel uh, and try to catch these fish. Uh, in addition, uh, I mentioned a little bit earlier, but fly fishing versus conventional fishing. Uh, here in the Bahamas, fly fishing is the main uh, way to catch bonefish. Uh, this is because different from conventional fishing, uh, the lure or the fly when you're fly fishing is oftentimes just uh, some animal fur and some feathers or you know um, synthetic versions of those two things tied onto a hook. So your lure or your fly, as we call it, is very, very light and does not make a lot of noise or commotion when you enter the water, which could scare the bonefish in these shallow environments. Now you can catch them on conventional tackle, uh, but because uh, bone fishing is a sight fishing uh, type of experience, by casting, instead you're walking around and trying to put a cast in front of a fish that you see itself. Um, and then finally, bonefish are challenging, right? I said they live in this shallow water environment for all their lives. It's where they do all their feeding. Uh, so they're very aware of what's around them. They're smart. They're very, very spooky, which means they're easily scared. Um, and that, that gin clear water, like you can see on that left image there, means that, like I said earlier, they can probably see you if you've already seen them. So you need to be an accurate caster. You need to be quiet. Uh, it's very different uh, type of fishing than what a lot of people are used to. So let's say that you've made that cast, your guide has spotted that fish for you, and you finally have one on the end of your line, you bring it in, and, and now it's picture time, right? You wanna, you wanna show off and, and say, hey, look, I caught a bonefish. Well, how do you handle this bonefish? Uh, there are a couple key points that need to be taken into account when you're actually handling the bonefish. Uh, bone fishing here in the Bahamas is mainly, in the Bahamas is mainly a catch and release fishery. Uh, so treating that fish well is important because bonefish and the fishery itself uh, are both finite uh, resources. You know, a lot of guides and a lot of people who fish with bonefish let them go. They're called bonefish for a reason. If you've ever eaten one, they have lots of tiny little bones that make them really hard to eat. Uh, and like we talked about earlier, they do bring in a lot of money for the Bahamas. Uh, so letting them go can help protect the resource. Uh, so there are a couple of things to keep in mind when you have caught a bonefish and you want to handle it. Uh, keeping those hands wet is super, super important. And it's definitely the first thing you should be aware of. Uh, bonefish, like all other fish, have a, a slimy outer coating on their skin, uh, on top of their scales, and that acts as their immune system. So it prevents them from getting sick and getting infections. So if you handle a fish, especially a bonefish, with dry hands, those dry hands can easily pull the slime off of that fish, and that fish might swim away fine and it might look healthy, but it could get sick or catch a disease a little bit later down the line, and because it doesn't have that slimy coat to protect it, uh, you have effectively killed that fish. Uh, in addition to keeping those hands wet, uh, limiting the air exposure uh, of a bonefish once you catch it is super important. If, once you catch a bonefish, it's like if I made you run a 100-yard dash, and then if I pick that bonefish up out of the water, it's as if your head was dunked underwater right after running that 100-yard dash. Right? They're really tired. They just fought for their life. Uh, so making sure that you're keeping those fish in the water for as long as possible to help recuperate them and help them recover is really important. If you do want to get a picture of the fish, uh, the best thing to do is to put a hand underneath their abdomen and your other hand around their tail and kind of lift them up for a couple of seconds, three, four, five seconds, make sure your buddy has the camera ready. And that way you're limiting that air exposure, you're supporting their organs inside, those hands are wet uh, and it's not super stressful for the fish. Finally, uh, keeping, the short, keeping the fight short 
is important. Uh, bonefish can actually exhaust themselves if you use tackle that is not designed to fish for bonefish. Uh, if the fight goes on for too long and you're using too light line, uh, bonefish can actually, you know, exhaust themselves to death and you release that fish and it can never recover and a shark or a barracuda can come snap that up. Uh, so just making sure that you're prepared with the right gear and keeping fight times short allows uh, the bonefish uh, to be released safely and continue uh, living on. So I have a couple of images here of uh, proper bonefish handling techniques. So you can see this angler here has that has his right hand underneath the abdomen of the fish and his left hand around the tail. This is a great way to hold the bonefish. The fish is still in the water. He doesn't even have to take the fish out of the water to get a good picture here. Uh, this is another great example. This is a smaller bonefish, so it's not really a two-hand job. Uh, this angler is keeping this fish all the way in the water, which I think is great. Uh, and especially with the clear water that we have here in the Bahamas, it's not always necessary to pull the fish all the way out of the water, like you can see in this picture. This bonefish is healthy. You can see he's kicking off, still full of energy because that angler had the right gear. He kept that fish in the water uh, and all that. And one last thing I will add about handling bonefish is when you're fishing for them, uh, pinching that barb down on your hook or using uh, barbless hooks is really important because it's a catch and release fishery and you're not trying to cat keep the fish. Uh, fishing with a barbless hook does significantly less damage to the fish uh, as well as makes releasing the fish a lot less stressful for the fish. And in addition, if you do manage to get that hook stuck in yourself somehow, uh, removing a barbless hook is a lot less painful than removing a hook with a barb. Uh, so Climate change uh, is an ever-present problem that we face every single day. Uh, it affects all facets of life, and especially in the natural world. And uh, bonefish, uh, believe it or not, will be affected by climate change. So as those, temperature, uh, as those temperatures increase, at first, it's going to be pretty good for bonefish. The waters uh, around the subtropics, that warm water is going to extend farther and farther away from the equator. So their home ranges are going to increase and they're going to have more room to spread out and we might actually see population increases uh, during the early stages of a warming planet. Uh, but with that comes different competition and different food sources. So uh, bonefish might have to move out of their traditional ranges and into uh, water that better suits them as it gets too hot in their normal range. And this might seem good at first, but over time, uh, they're going to have to start competing with species that are foreign to them, the food sources that they're used to, might not exist in those new waters, uh, or they might not be as plentiful because there are other fish that are more adapted to that environment that they're not having to compete with. Uh, we are actually seeing this with other species of fish around the world already. Uh, up on the eastern coast of Canada and north northern America, or northern United States, uh, we're seeing striped bass are moving into uh, more brackish waters along the coast where Atlantic salmon have traditionally gone and spawned, and they're now out competing the Atlantic salmon in their spawning ranges because the oceans are getting a little bit too warm for the striped bass, and they're moving to try to find uh, cooler water. So it's not you know, an invasive species, it's just the fish reacting to the climate change, and we can see that the competition, the food sources, it's not enough to sustain both species. So we will probably see this uh, in the future if the projected models of climate change continue to, to come true. Uh, in addition, with climate change happening, we're also seeing increased levels of ocean acidification in the, the world's oceans. Uh, so as carbon levels go up and pH goes down, the calcium carbonate saturation levels decrease uh, and the oceans are sequestering more carbon from the atmosphere. And basically what this means um, that as those calcium carbonate satura saturation levels decrease, uh, organisms that re require calcium carbonate to form shells like crabs, shrimp, uh, other benthic invertebrates that these bonefish are feeding on, they're going to have a harder time doing so, which means that the main prey source of bonefish, as these oceans continue to sequester more carbon and become more acidic, uh, those prey sources are going to start to die out, and the bonefish are going to have a lot to feed on. Um, and, you know, as, as bonefish are maybe moving away from the Bahamas and their natural ranges or Maybe we're seeing population decreases linked to warming temperatures and ocean acidification. Uh, the Bahamian uh, economy is going to take a serious hit. We talked earlier about how much uh, how much money each year bone fishing brings in. So, as climate is as the climate is changing, you know the the country of the Bahamas, not just the people who like to catch bone fish, are really going to suffer.
Um, and so on staff, we do have a couple of bonefish guides that work with us. Uh, Ricardo Riley and uh, Fleming Riley uh, are both part of our facilities team here at Fort Farfield Station on Andros. Uh, and they both guide for bonefish as well. So if you guys ever do uh, end up coming and visiting us or next time you're back down here in the Bahamas, they are great people to reach out to uh, and talk about seeing these changes in real time and over their course of a career as bone fishing guides, they've actually been seeing, you know, the numbers of bonefish start to decrease. So this is a, a real time problem that we're, we're seeing. Uh, but, you know, as, as doom and gloom as that may sound, there are, there are positives in the world of conservation and bonefish. Uh, anglers are actually a great uh, source of conservation. You know, anglers want to protect uh, the, the bonefish because a healthy fishery and a healthy ecosystem means there's more fish to catch. So a lot of times uh, we see anglers at the forefront of conservation efforts uh, practicing things like catch and release, catch and release and raising awareness of the issues that these uh, species that people wanna catch are facing on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the bonefish guides and their clients, the anglers who are coming to the Bahamas and other countries to catch these bonefish, they're on the water more than anybody. They're seeing these changes every single day. Uh, they're seeing these changes in real time. So they're constantly on the water um, and they're helping researchers actually and conservation groups by keeping them up to date with what the population numbers are like season to season. If they catch maybe a tagged fish that's being tracked, uh, they can let the researchers know where they found that fish, sort of stuff like that. Um, and so here you have an example of an angler on the right in that bottom picture is holding a bonefish that he caught uh, with a fly rod. And on the left, uh, someone from a conservation group is actually tagging that fish. So even simple things like actually catching the fish for the researchers to, to tag and track, uh, anglers are at the very forefront of those kinds of conservation efforts. Uh, finally, we have licensing. So uh, recently, you know, 2016-ish, uh, the Bahamas passed some legislature that uh, decided that anglers who were visiting the country had to purchase a flats fishing or a bone fishing permit if they were going to come fish in Bahamian waters. Uh, now, this money gets uh, directly recycled back into the economy, uh, and this has been a great source of income uh, for the country itself. And it also holds anglers accountable, right? On the, on the license, it's going to let you know that there are fines if you break certain rules according to fishing for bonefish. If you're caught fishing without a license, it's a fine. So it helps anglers keep uh, conservation ideas and keep themselves responsible, you know, in the forefront of their minds. Uh, so here in the Bahamas, there are a bunch of conservation efforts to help protect bonefish and their environments and the fishery itself. And I'll just go over a couple of those really quick. Uh, so we have Bonefish and Tarpon Trust, which is a Miami-based nonprofit uh, that works to not only restore uh, bonefish habitat and population numbers, but also tarpon per permit to other pretty popular flats fishing species. Uh, we also have the Fisheries Conservation Foundation, uh, which is an Illinois based nonprofit and, and they do some pretty similar things focused on you know tracking the spawning locations of bonefish for example and trying to lobby uh, politicians to protect those areas in order to protect the future of the species we have the cape luther institute here in the bahamas um, they're really heavily involved in the educational aspect of uh let, like working with conservation groups and outreach to the public which has been a great resource uh, we also have bahamas national trust uh, which kind of acts like the Parks Department for the Bahamas. Uh, they're the ones out on the water enforcing these rules and legislation every day. Uh, and uh, we also have the Nature Conservancy. So all of these organizations are working, you know, on the small scale, on the large scale with anglers, guides, as well as the Bahamian government uh, to try and enact legislature and promote healthy flats fisheries through research, political advocacy and stuff like that. Uh, and finally, uh, excuse me. Finally, we have uh, a bunch of marine parks recently that have been uh, put in place in the Bahamas and Andrew specifically. Uh, BNT or Bahamas National Trust has worked with the Bahamian government uh, to create multiple marine parks uh, in order to pr protect these marine resources. There is no fishing at all allowed uh, in these areas, and this helps protect uh, bonefish and their food sources, as well as many other fish uh, and marine life in the area. And here at Fort Far Field Station, we actually have uh, two of the marine parks right out our front door. Uh, so we're seeing those changes every single day and seeing that conservation, uh, 
you know, mindset every single day. So that's all I have uh, for you guys on that presentation. Uh, I'd love to, I'd love to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go back to my screen here. Uh, let's go ahead. Ooh, lots of likes. Nice. Okay. Um, we are going to. All right. We're just going to go back to the questions, I think. All right. All right. So I'm going to go through some of the questions uh, that we have here. Looks good. Thank you, Todd. Hello, Elizabeth. Um, let's see. Alan asked if there's any specific season that's good for bone fishing. Uh, actually, bonefish is a year-round fishery here in the Bahamas. Uh, they're they're eating 365 days a year. So a lot of times people come down here uh, during the winter months to kind of escape the, the cold weather in North America to fish. Uh, fish are really, really active in the summer, uh, early in the morning and in the early afternoon because the water is so warm, uh, but kind of shut down during the middle of the day. Whereas in the winter, they're kind of active all day, but maybe not, maybe not eating as much throughout the year. Uh, so really there is no bad time to come down for bonefish. Um, they can kind of spawn throughout, uh, throughout, uh, throughout the year. So really they're always eating and it's always a good time to come down and, and fish for, uh, fish for bonefish. Uh, Patrick, hello. My group is supposed to be arriving tomorrow. Patrick, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, I know this is not a great time for a lot of people, but hopefully we can, uh, figure something out for the future and get you rescheduled and get you guys to come back down here. We are missing our groups. Uh, do bonefish have any defense mechanism? Asked Megan. Uh, so, their only defense mechanism is their speed and their camouflage. Uh, so bonefish can swim uh, up to 40 miles an hour, uh, which is a pretty astounding number for such a small fish. And as far as that camouflage, they can be really hard to see from above. So predators like osprey up in the air have a tough time seeing them. And if they start to get chased by a shark or a barracuda, really their only defense mechanism is to leave the flat as quickly as possible. Um, Matt Ainsworth asked if there's any other fellow anglers here. I hope so. I hope this was relevant for a lot of you guys. Uh, does IFS work with bonefish and tarpon trust at all? Um, so we are not directly related to uh, any bonefish conservation groups or bonefishing specifically at Forfar here. Uh, Andros is the bonefish capital of the world, so a lot of people come down here to fish for bonefish. Uh, we are aware of all of those conservation groups and more that I mentioned earlier, uh, and we see their work in real time, uh, but we don't focus on boat fishing here at Forfar. We are more geared towards the environmental experiential uh, aspects of learning about the marine world and uh, the terrestrial world as well. Um, so we are aware of them. We appreciate the work they're doing for conservation, but we are not directly involved ourselves. Uh, Tori asked if fishing for bonefish in the Bahamas is similar to what you see on the show River Monsters. Uh, no, that's a great show. Uh, good question, Tori. Um, no, River Monsters, that guy, Jeremy Wade, focuses on catching uh, a lot of big freshwater fish. Uh, bonefish, like I said, the biggest one ever caught in the Bahamas was only 20 pounds. Uh, so some of the te techniques might be pretty similar, uh, but they're not exactly uh, the type of fish that that guy might go after. Is angler just another word for fisherman? Yes, angler and fisherman are the same thing. Uh, just a just a different term for the same word. Uh, how do you how do they prevent overfishing? Asks Emily. So, uh, with a lot of the Bahamian economy being focused on bone fishing and catch and release being pretty big in the fly fishing world, which is where a lot of those uh, anglers or fishermen uh, are spending their money and coming down to fly fish. Um, you know, commercial harvest for bonefish doesn't really exist here anymore. So overfishing is not a super serious problem. Uh, what is a problem, though, is uh, development uh, in the waters near spawning locations. Uh, so some of you guys may have heard that Disney Cruise Lines is trying to build a port uh, on Eleuthera, and that's actually really close to a, a well-known uh, bonefish spawning aggregation. Uh, so things like that are more of a problem for bonefish populations than overfishing. Uh, so there's more uh, lobbying for legislation and stuff like that to prevent uh, spawning sites from being prevented. But, you know, it's not really a commercial fishery. 
Uh, Kim Collins, I may have missed this info, but there are there size limits? Uh, Kim, I don't know off the top of my head if there are size limits. I apologize. Um, I personally, I do fish for bonefish, um, and I, I never keep my fish, so I have not really paid attention to that. Um, but I'm sure if you went on to uh, any of those conservation websites that I mentioned earlier, like Bonefish, Tarpon Trust, uh, that sort of thing, even the BNT website, Bahamas National Trust, they have information for that on you. Um, Jeremiah just asked if I have been able to bone fish for yourself, for myself, and how would I rate it as a recreational activity? Uh, yeah, I am very, very lucky to be working here with International Field Studies on Andros Island. Um, so in my free time, I am able to fish for bonefish. I'm a pretty big fly fisherman myself, and uh, like I said, Andros Island is the bonefish capital of the world. So, uh, you know, right out, right out front, sometimes we see bonefish. So. Uh, as far as I would rate it as a recreational activity, I think it's great. Uh, I think it's something that everyone should try at least once in their lives. Um, you know, Andros is a beautiful place and the bonefish is a super important species to the Bahamas economically and, you know, culturally as well. And I think, uh, catching a bonefish and how much fun it is to catch their great fighters. Like I said, they can, uh, travel as fast as 40 miles an hour, you know, once they're hooked and they're trying to escape. Uh, it's a lot of fun and, and it takes you to a lot of beautiful places. So I, I highly recommend it as a recreational activity, Jeremiah. All right, so I think I answered uh, every question in here. And, you know, I'll, I'll stick around for another minute or two if anybody else has any other questions. Uh, hopefully you guys uh, learned a lot today. Uh, I really like talking about bonefish and uh, you know, international field studies and, and the educational staff here at Forfar, um, we are working on a lot of mini episodes and live webinars like this to kind of post regularly to make sure that people, you know, who maybe might have had to cancel their trips to Forfar, or people who are interested in what we're doing, they're able to learn about us uh, and learn about what we teach about from home. So last week we posted an episode featuring another educational staff member, Haley Collins. Uh, she talked about calcium carbonate and how that's important and what it's like on Andrews Island. That's found on our website uh, under the webinar section at internationalfieldstudies.org. Um, and like I said, we'll have more webinars and many episodes coming on a variety of topics. It's not just going to be bonefish and geology. We have uh, terrestrial ecology, marine ecology, all sorts of different topics. Um, and of course, you know, reach out to us on social media. Uh, if you have any comments or questions or even suggestions on what you guys would like to hear and, and what you would like us to teach you guys about, because we love uh, the educational aspect of the work that we do here at Four Far Field Station, and we are definitely missing having groups come and visit, so this is a great way for us to reach you guys and and uh, and kind of talk about what we do here at Four Far. So hopefully this was enjoyable to people, and uh, like I said, I hope you learned something. Thanks very much for tuning in. Uh, Kim Collins, thank you very much. That's a nice comment. Uh, so yeah, I think I'm going to go ahead and end it here. Like I said, guys, reach out to us on, on social media and let us know what you think and what you want to hear about next time. Uh, we'll see you guys next week.